Death Claims, A Day Brandstetter Mystery, Book 2, Author, Joseph Hansen, Publisher, University of Wisconsin Press, Terrace Books, Narrator, Eric Ost. Chapter 5 Ovals of leather patched the elbows of Charles Norwood's jacket. It was rugged Scots tweed and had been expensive some time ago. Soft gray fuzz sprouted on the back of his neck, above a shirt collar that was frayed. A hen screw of his glasses had been replaced by a snipped-off pen or paper clip, but his mustache was neatly trimmed, his shave was clean and close, his hands straightening books already straight on a table marked reduced, were well kept. His speech was modulated, the voice deep but a little old maidish, his smile regretted. Peter, he hasn't been in here for months. Here meant Oates and Norwood, antiquarian books, in one of those arcades of shops favored in El Molino. Tall wrought iron gates standing open in a thick archway to a courtyard paved with terracotta squares and enclosed by buildings of rough white stucco with roofs of carved red tile, olive trees dusty green and gray, a fountain weeping into algaed water from beneath the sandaled feet of a stained cement St. Francis. Blessing stained cement doves, real doves, grieved overhead. The noise of late afternoon street traffic was muted. The shop was dim and hushed, but it probably was dim and hushed at high noon, too. Its centerpiece was a big 18th century globe of the world, rich with mottled green and browns cradled in a curved rack of time-mellowed wood. Dave spun it idly on its brass axis. His fingers came away dusty. Since his father burned himself? Norwood nodded. He left home about that time, went to live with a girl in Arena Blanca, the same girl John went to after his discharge from the hospital. You know her name. She worked here? Norwood smiled, chagrin. April Stannard, I've made a habit of avoiding it. For whose sake? I get the impression she was the only one aside from Peter who gave a damn for him. His wife walked out. Is that the way April tells it? It's what she told me, isn't it true? Norwood didn't answer. His hands stopped fidgeting with the books, and he shifted his eyes to a woman who stopped in the doorway, dark glasses, blonde wig, fringed leather bolero, over a white turtleneck jersey, fringed leather shoulder strap, purse at the hip of her white slacks. Eve, Norwood said, this man is from the company that insured John's life. He's looking for Peter. The light was behind her. Dave couldn't see her expression, but she went very still for a second. Then she came to him in squeaky straw sandals with flat heels that clapped. She stood close, took off the dark glasses, frowned. She was very blonde, but time hadn't done her creamy skin any kindnesses. It was webbed like a winter morning window in snow country. She was tall for a woman and looked strong, not heavy, but strong. Why, Peter, she said. I was John's beneficiary. I'm afraid not, Mrs. Oates. He must have made a change when the two of you separated. But she didn't go on. She shut her mouth hard, turned abruptly, and went fast through a doorway in a wall of books at the near of the shop. Norwood drew a sharp breath. He started to reach after her. He didn't call out. He dropped the hand. He looked sick. As he stared at Dave, the corner of his mouth twitched. His voice came out a croak. There must be some mistake. He almost ran for a counter where a telephone squatted by a beautiful old cash register of pierced cast iron. A call. He snatched up the receiver. What's the number there? Dave's watch read 525. The switchboard will be closed, he said. But there's no mistake. He laid a card on the counter. Call tomorrow. They'll tell you. Numbly, Norwood lowered the phone into place. In the room beyond the wall of books, there was a quiet light now, and a bottleneck rattled against the glass. Norwood heard it too. A dry tongue touched his lips. He gave a pained smile. Well, I suppose you must be right. It's just such a shock. I apologize for getting excited. He flicked a glance at the door to the back room and shadow above it. 
ghostly pale. A bust of Antinous bowed its head. Look, would you excuse us now? For drinks? Dave said. I'd even join you if you'd asked me. Norwood jerked with surprise. Why, I... He smiled, stopped smiling, smiled again. Of, of course. Pleasure. Eve? He turned, rubbing nervous hands. Mr. He picked up the card and tilted his head back to read it through his bifocals. Mr. Branstetter will join us for martini martinis? Oh. She stood in the doorway, a squat glass in each hand. The olives stirred. The ice cubes rattled. Why? I need to find Peter. Maybe you can tell me something that will give me a lead. Her ice-blue eyes watched him for a quarter of a minute. Then she gave a shrudge and turned away. I doubt it. But come in. Under friendlier circumstances, snug would have been the word for the back room. Red leather armchairs faced a low golden oak table where a Tiffany lamp glowed over books, catalogs, a loose stack of pa letters. The top letter looked like a book list. He frowned. Where had he seen that elegantly engraved letterhead before? He shook his head. He couldn't remember. On a desk under a window of wired frosted glass on old black, L.C. Smith waited between stacked books stuck with slips of paper and a marbled paste board box of file cards. The desk was a bar, too. Bottles glinted there. Shelves went darkly up all around, weighted by books and supplies. Eve Oates handed Dave a martini in a glass that matched hers and Norwood's, but had a chip in its rim. Norwood, still looking pale, waved at a chair. Thanks, Dave sat and waited for them to sit. He looked at Eve. Has Peter been to you? Did he come home? What for? She lit a cigarette. Her hands were unsteady. The match flame jittered. She shook it out and said flatly, When he left home, he took everything he owned. She blew smoke away as if it annoyed her and swallowed a third of a drink. He decided in his infant wisdom that I'd wronged his precious father, and he hated me. Couldn't live under the same roof without with me another minute. A sour smile tugged a corner of her mouth. All right, I said. Go if you want to. I think it shook him. He'd expected motherly tears and pleadings. The young lived by cliché. But he went grimly. No. I haven't seen him since. She took another long swallow of a drink. On the far side of the table, the silent Norwood worked on his like an assignment. I don't expect to. He was always stubborn. I'll never forget the fight he put up as a baby when the time came for him to begin eating solid food. Let me tell you. Her laugh was like crackling glass. It was a contest of wills. I very nearly didn't win. He was determined to starve to death rather than eat that repulsive goop. She finished off the drink and reached across the circle of light to collect Norwood's derelict ice cube. Her hand paused over Dave's drink. Her eyebrows worried, but he barely nicked it and he shook his head. She got up and rattled glass some more in the shadows around the desk. I could tell you a boring succession of anecdotes about that child's mulishness. He was wrong about you and John Oates. He had no understanding whatever of how things were. She came back and set Norwood's drink in front of him and dropped into her chair again. He was far too young. They get the idea that because their arms and legs stretch and they're suddenly as tall as their parents, they're adults. Of course he was wrong. She shook another cigarette from its hard pack, marble. You didn't walk out on Peter's father when he was fighting for his life? The hand with the cigarette stopped in its way to her mouth. Her eyes narrowed and glinted dangerously. He's talked to April, Charles Norwood said. Ah, has he? She didn't ask it. She said it. Well, she set the cigarette in her mouth, scratched a paper match, and talked to Norwood. I was going to tell him to go to hell with his prying. The match was curling black inside the flame. She touched the flame to a cigarette and dropped the match in the ashtray and leveled a hard look at Dave. <sighs> but I think I want to set the record straight. 
A short time after Miss April came to work here, I found her with John in, shall we be elegant about it, a compromising situation? In this very room, I understood. He was a man like all men, and like most men in their forties, foolish. She was very pretty, very young, and more importantly, very willing. That's understandable. John had a great deal of charm. She told me, Dave said. Yes, I'll bet she did. Well, I didn't make a scene. We talked it out sensibly. John and I, like grown-ups, John saw my point of view and April went, so that was that, until his accident. Then she came back to the hospital. I couldn't be there constantly. It takes at least two people to run this shop. She had no shop to look after. There's money in her background. The Stenards are an old El Molino family. She was there night and day, the nurses told me. John didn't know it. He was under heavy sedation, but there she sat, like something out of Olive Higgins' prouty. Eve picked up her glass and tilted it steeply. This drink wasn't going to last even as long as number one. She set the glass down noiselessly. Her voice had the texture of a rusty file. Naturally, when John began to be aware at all, it was faithful April he was aware of. I was a vague face that came and went. He didn't reason about it. Of course, a man in pain like that hasn't time for reason. I know it. But John was something of a special case, you see. Mr. Branstetter, is that right? She arched one eyebrow. The name, Dave said. Yes, that's right. Scandinavian. Brand's daughter. Isn't that what it means? Yes. Funny. Her smile was thin and hungry. You certainly don't look like anyone's daughter. Appearances can be deceiving, Dave said. Ha! <laughs> she shot at Norwood a dismal look. Despite limited opportunities, I still know a man when I see one. John, Dave reminded her, was a special case. Yes, he'd never been ill before. Never. He didn't know how to cope with it. Oh, life hadn't been exactly generous to him. He'd had disasters, but you see, I'd always been there, right there, right at his side, to get him through somehow. He'd come to rely pretty heavily, pretty constantly on me for that. He'd make a mess. I'd pick up the pieces. Well, this was one mess I couldn't help him with. No one could but doctors, nurses, and he couldn't grasp that. I'd always come to his rescue for close to thirty years. This time... I couldn't. I was as helpless as he was, and he hated me. Really hated me for that. She drank again. April Stenard couldn't help him either. Oh, you are so right. Her mouth took a wry, sad twist. So completely right, but did he see it that way? No. Somehow, her always being there made a difference. Her hands went up and fell like shot birds. God knows what goes on in the romantic mind. I've never been able to fathom it. He said she loved him. Eve got rid of the phrase like bad food. And I didn't. Good God, I ask you. Since it, was, since it was all that could be done and she was doing it, maybe it was enough. Dave stood. Can you give me some ideas about where Peter might be? Your urgency puzzles me. She raised a hand to keep the lamplight out of her eyes and blinked up at him. Insurance companies aren't known for frantic efforts to locate those they owe payments to. True. There's more to the story, he told it. Oh, seriously? She laughed, shook her head, picked up her drink, and finished it off. I'm surprised at you. I thought you were complicated. How transparent. If he'd murdered his father... You wouldn't have to pay. It's not only transparent, it's sordid. And you didn't strike me as the least bit grubby. It shows how appearances deceive. I'm disappointed. Craziest thing I ever heard. Norwood got up and went with his glass into the desk dark. Peter and his father were friends. Friends fall out, Dave said. Mrs. Oates and her husband, for example. Ah, she said, but John and I were never friends. We were dependents. 
He depended on me for common sense and backbone. I depended on him for... Well, he was beautiful and charming. Draw your own conclusions. She bent into the light of her glass and and held it out for Norwood. But Peter and John might have been monosagiotic twins. They thought alike, moved alike, spoke alike, looked alike. They cared for the same things. They were, I don't know the words for it, absolutely gone on each other. I suppose you'd say they're the only two people I've ever known who lived together for 20 years and genuinely enjoyed every minute of it. And teamed up against you, I'm told, Dave said. She got a new drink for Norwood. When she turned back, her smile was sardonic. And were twice as weak that way. You see, they not only had each other's virtues, they had each other's flaws. It's what makes your fantasy so absurd. Neither of them would have had the courage to kill anyone. She frowned thoughtfully. Except, of course, themselves. John was doing that with morphine. It came out in the medical re examiner's report at the inquest. He was an addict. It was for the pain, Dave said. She shook her head. The pain was long past. As Dr. DeKalb. Norwood came back and sat down. He could have drowned himself. He was badly scarred and he'd been proud of his looks. Also, he had no money, no future. April didn't mind the scars, Dave said. She was getting jobs, they were eating, there was a roof over their heads. April was his future. Peter, Eve Oates said stubbornly. Not at the end. His wanting to change the policy shows that Peter had walked out on him. No, I don't know why, but they must have quarreled. Unthinkable. She held her hand against the light again. Its shadow masked her eyes. Your eagerness to save your company money is muddling your mind. If Peter killed his father for his insurance, why hasn't he tried to collect it? What's he doing? Having the horrors someplace, Dave said. Murder takes some people that way. Doing it is one thing. Living with it is another. Thanks for the drink. He went out through the dusky shop. A Gay Mysteries Audiobooks I think it is easy to hate a label, but a face humanizes the word. So this effort is twofold, to offer comfort to those like myself that your world didn't end because you don't fit into the view of acceptable society on both sides, and in hopes of helping those with family that are LGBTQ, that it doesn't mean we are aliens from the child they once knew, reassure them so they can maybe be supportive at the same time being true to their values.